This is the MedicCast, July 4th, 2011. Happy Independence Day. Transmitters? We don't need no stinking transmitters. This is the MediCast, a podcast for EMS providers by EMS providers, featuring EMS news, products, tips, tricks, and commentary. So grab your gear and glove up. Here's today's show with the pod medic, Jamie Davis. Well, good day and welcome to this week's episode of the MedicCast. I'm your host, Jamie Davis, the pod medic, and I'd like to welcome everybody to the program this week. We have a lot of great stuff coming up for you, and I hope you will stick around, including uh, tips of the week that'll come up right after our news. And uh, today we're going to be actually bringing Lisa Booz back to talk about accidental EpiPen injection, something right up our alley. So uh, I think a lot of myths and things will be debunked as we talk about accidental EpiPen injection coming up here. And uh, so stick around for that in the second half of the show. In the meantime, I do want to remind you to catch up with all of the links to everything discussed in this episode over at the MedicCast website. And that's available over at MedicCast.com slash blog. And you can find a link for the show notes right there at the top of the page. So check out that link and follow up on the resources and information provided in the show there. You can also catch up with me by email, podmedic at mac.com. And there's a bunch of other ways to catch up with me and you can find all of that information over on the website. And I Get over to the website, check out the MedicCast blog, share it with the folks you know, and of course share the show, whether you catch the video version of the show, and, um, and of course you can go directly to that page on the site just by going to MedicCast.tv. But whether it's video or audio, thanks for sharing the show and keep it up, folks. We'd really appreciate it, and we really see numbers uh, you know, start to grow uh, when I ask, that, ask you all to do that. So don't forget to share the MedicCast with somebody you know today. Let's jump into some listener email comments I received recently. Um, I got a great comment in from listener Clint, first off thanking me for trying to cover and do all the EMS things that we do here on the show to keep people educated and up to date. And um, I thank you very much for uh, making those comments, Clint. And you know we're, we're solidly into year six here as we're approaching, uh, you know, we just wrapped up our fifth year, I think uh, in uh, January or so. And moving into, uh, you know, almost halfway through our sixth year here on the MedicCast. And I just want to uh, say it's great to be able to provide these resources. Uh, I'm passionate about it. I get a lot out of doing this show, too, because it forces me to stay engaged and involved with what's going on in the medical community. He actually talks a little bit about that as well in his email, where he, um, Clint, talks about the, the cookie cutter, what I call the cookie cutter approach to EMS education, that we're teaching people to be a cookbook type medics, uh, you know, add a cup of this and a dose of this and a pinch of this for this problem without any really understanding what you're doing, why you're doing it, and what's going on with the patient. There are some places that educate EMTs and paramedics as medical professionals and have a certain expectation, even at the BLS level, that there's going to be a minimum amount of understanding of anatomy and physiology. Uh, there's other areas of the country where EMTs and even paramedics are treated as you know, ambulance drivers and first aid providers. It really is important as we advance our profession that we need to raise the professional bar, at least for the advanced level of care. And that means paramedic level. We need to say, yes, this needs to be uh, an associate's degree minimum. Um, we need to encourage that bachelor's level paramedics are going to be trained at, you know, to a similar amount and, and level of broad knowledge as, for instance, nurses in their particular career path. They're different and the focus will be different, but paramedics, there's no reason that we can't have an even deeper understanding of pharmacology as it, as it associates with the specific areas we're involved with. And so I think that there's just a lot we can do. Clint brings that up and talks about it. Uh, you know, it starts with all of you. You need to be actively involved in making yourself the best you can be. If you're listening and checking out this show and other programs, hopefully you're receiving that information in part from some of the things I try to cover. But you're doing it. You're making those steps to try to stay informed. So kudos to you. But there's more than that. You also need to have an expectation of the people around you. You need to have an expectation and responsibility to be a good educator 
and a good role model to new members in our community and existing members. And you need to step up and say, I'm going to raise the bar and continue my education, whether it's going on into nursing. You know, just because I'm a nurse doesn't mean I can't also be a paramedic and operate in both modes. Uh, and, and I think that there are ways that you can raise your education. I'd love that. I wish there was a, a you know, way I could have easily moved into a bachelor's degree program for paramedic, but unfortunately, just not, it's just not easy to do that. There aren't that many colleges that teach a dedicated real EMS bachelor's course, um, and those that do don't really make it, it's not always that easy to move on. It's usually just a management course. It's really just a, uh, you know, a bachelor's degree in business and management with uh, a focus on public safety and health, and it's just not really what we, you know, what I was looking for. So I, I think that that's part of it. So whatever it is you do, you need to advance your, your knowledge base and stay educated and become involved in educating and be an advocate for raising the bar. If we wanna be treated more as medical professionals, we need to act more like medical professionals and we need to educate ourselves to the level of other medical professionals. And we haven't done that to this point. Um, we really are being educated as technicians, not as thinking, critical thinking healthcare professionals. And I know a lot of us consider ourselves that and have educated ourselves to that point, but the profession as a whole is not, does not hold that expectation, and that's a problem. So until that paradigm changes, we're gonna be stuck in the, the position, and rut, the rut we're in, in many situations. So, hey, Clint, thanks for sending in that email, and I hope to get many more from you, and thanks for being a supporter of the show. Just real quick, um, I got a, an email in from Ross uh, talking about uh, changes. Uh, he used to be a paramedic and uh, now is uh, involved as a, let me see, uh, now is going back into. So lose, lost his paramedic, uh, let it lapse back in the early 90s, uh, coming back here but almost 20 years later and uh, getting it started again and recertifying and talks a lot about the change in his education. You know, when he got educated in the 80s or whatever, you know, there was just not, you know, universal precautions were frowned on. <laughs> you know, people, blood used to be a badge of honor when you got blood all over yourself. It meant you were in the middle of it. And, and now, heck, you know, we're screaming bloody murder and calling for our moms when we get a speck of blood on us. We're, and, and as it should be. I think we've advanced beyond where we were, but he, he just points out that the class is a lot different now. And, you know, Randy, I, I hope um, if, if you will make sure you keep sending these emails in here, I will continue to uh, get back in touch with you. Of course, all of you know that. Send me an email, podmedic at mac.com or call in on the voicemail line, 941-306-3342. And you can share your thoughts here with me. And I always try to get back to everybody that I hear from and uh, check in with you. And it's just great to hear from all the listeners. So keep uh, that stuff coming. Don't forget you can watch the show in a lot of different places too, uh, mediccast.tv. And of course you can find it all over uh, the web and on some of the set top boxes and things like that. So just keep supporting the show, spreading the word about what we're doing. And hey, we're gonna be coming up here soon in Las Vegas in the end of August for EMS World Expo. So if you're thinking of heading to EMS World Expo, we're gonna be there with the podcast studio again. We, uh, we put chairs out so you can come and get a bite to eat, sit down and maybe listen to part of or all of a show, uh, hang out and meet your favorite podcasters while you're in the exhibit hall. Um, we're actually working on a deal where we might be able to get a big hotel discount for you and you'll be able to stay in the same place we're staying and we're gonna do maybe some breakfast meetups or something like that with everybody. So there might be some opportunities to do a lot of fun things there. And so I hope you'll, if you're in the area or able to make it to Vegas, uh, even if you come by for a day, stop in and catch up with us at the podcast studio. You, Chris Montero will be there, Greg Freeze, Kelly Grayson, and Ron Davis from the Confessions of an EMS Newbie podcast. Just a lot of great shows there. Um, Natalie, Miss Paramedic. Uh, every, it's going to be a lot of fun. So I hope you'll come. And a lot of you have come by the booth already. And uh, when we've gone and done these shows in the past, and we're going to continue to work on doing them and continue to get out there and talk about what's going on at these major events. So if you can't make it, uh, you can either follow the live stream or catch the recorded episode when it plays a few weeks after the conference is over. 
And uh, we'll get on into the rest of the show, including our tip of the week here, our, our new segment here in just a second. Well, we'll jump into the news segment, and I'll start off with a story on um, peripheral, peripheral artery, artery disease. <laughs> Trying to spit that one out is tough for some reason. Uh, but there's a recent study that was released talking about cigarette smoking and its relationship with peripheral artery disease. This is, relationship has been known for a long time, but not studied specifically in women. And this particular article actually looked at women increasing their chances of developing peripheral artery disease in uh, when they were sm smokers. Um, and this is something uh, you, you don't think about. I mean, you, people that have poor circulation, right? They uh, talk about that they might have this as a problem, uh, experience cold extremities. Uh, this puts them at greater risk for heart attack. Um, it, it's just a whole host of things going along with this. And it's, it's another you know, thing that points at the long-term healthcare effects of smoking. And I don't think anybody denies that cigarette smoking is bad for you. Uh, you know, that's, that's, that, you know, that train has left the station. We all know that. But uh, there's a lot of things that we can do. And unfortunately, a lot of EMS professionals smoke, uh, wish, wish they didn't. And, uh, I, you know, I, all I can say is that I want you all to be around for as long as you possibly can be. Uh, but it's another thing to think about. You know, you see all of these people that have long-term health issues related to their smoking. Um, you know, try to take a lesson from some of these things. Start really looking at the health problems that your COPDers are having, uh, the long-term health issues associated with uh, the, the uh, poor lifestyle choices and uh, try to see if you can you know, find a way to quit. There's lots of good tips. Actually, this article itself actually has smoking, quit, quit smoking tips. Um, so I hope that um, you know, this is something that you can uh, keep in your bag of tricks and uh, just be aware of, look at this type of study and see these things come by. And you, know, you build a healthier community one step at a time. And that, step, that next step might be making yourself a little healthier. And uh, if not you, then you know, having information about how to help your patients be healthier. If you're already a non-smoker or have quit smoking, uh, you can keep information about uh, local smoking cessation programs that the local health department has or the local hospital has and keep the pamphlets in the back of your ambulance. So I, one of the things I like to do um, and have done in the past and seen done in other places is keep a folder of some of those resources or a small binder with some pocket sleeves in it and then you can just uh, kind of flip the binder open, pull out a flyer and hand it to the, the caregiver or the family member that's there and say, hey, hang on to this. Um, it might be something that can help you all out longer in a longer term basis. Uh, you know, prevention's part of our job too and it's Sometimes, uh, you know, it's a. I always joke that it's just a paragraph in one of our textbooks and says, hey, prevention's our job. Uh, and then it moves on into treating acute problems. The, that's one of the problems with our healthcare system. We're all about treating problems after they arise rather than preventing problems from occurring in the beginning. And I think that we need to be part of that process as well. So keep it this in mind and uh, you know you can check out the full article and all the information that are that's posted there uh, over at the link in the show notes for the episode but you should follow up on these things next up an article about uh, improvements in how we're treating stroke patients uh, more patients are getting their clot busting drugs their tpa and other clot busters put into their systems when they've had stroke, they're getting into the hospital and getting these uh, drugs applied, uh, um, given to them, and they are having better outcomes. But the numbers are not that much higher that, that stroke researchers aren't saying, hey, there's still a ton of room for improvement. One of the things they've identified is that the key issue is still getting the patient to the hospital in that window of time where we can still give them clot busting drugs when they get there. So we can have stroke teams and we can have stroke integration with that local stroke center and the local EMS system. But if the patient doesn't call you when the stroke first happens or they don't recognize a stroke and think they're just not feeling good, um, you end up getting, not getting called until two or three, four hours after the event started. So the one part of the puzzle, according to this article, that seems to be missing most consistently is educating our public. So I know I'm a big proponent of going out there and doing CPR education. Don't forget that a key part of that CPR education includes educating about other things like um, stroke, <laughs> like 
uh, not just sudden cardiac arrest, but also all the acute coronary syndromes and choking. And so those four things are what that class helps to teach about. And don't forget the stroke component there. Really emphasize stroke awareness in your community. And there's lots of different ways. We've talked about all the ways you can do this. Heck, you can, you can do a YouTube video and get it posted about stroke awareness. Um, have a little fun with it. Get some attention. Um, do a stroke flash mob somewhere. I don't care, but do something. And uh, because that's, the where, that's where we're still dropping the ball. And it is a system-wide approach, just like with cardiac arrest. You need the whole system. And part of that system is the guy who picks up the phone and calls 911. So we need to remember that we need to educate our public how, to, how and when to use our system appropriately. And strokes are part of it. And we need to let people know, hey, if you think somebody's going to have a stroke, speed is of the essence, just like it was a heart attack. So good information. I hope you'll uh, follow up. There's good information in that article too. Finally, just a great article talking about freestanding emergency departments that seem to be more and more of them on the rise around the country. And these are not attached to any specific hospital. Um, they could be urgent care centers or uh, areas, places basically that can handle anything that is not likely to need to be admitted to the hospital. They can handle. What's the advantage? Well, guess what? We don't have to wait in line, right? And so if your local protocol allows you to drop a patient there, that's great. The other thought process is that maybe it'll take some of the load off the local hospital emergency department that is getting bumps and bruises, cuts and scrapes that don't are never going to require them to be admitted, but they go there because that's the emergency center, right? Well, they could go to this other emergency room that is, is going to have get to them quicker, deal with them faster, and get them out the door and leave that hospital-based emergency center for that critical patient that needs emergent attention, admission to the hospital, and additional follow-up. Uh, so it's a good article talking about these facilities. If your protocols don't allow you to transport to these alternative centers in priority three patients with treatable problems, easily treatable problems, you should contact whoever's doing your local protocols and really ask the question, why? You know, the next time you get stacked up at the hospital and end up waiting for 45 minutes or an hour because you can't, you can't go ahead and you know, get your patient unloaded and they're wait you're waiting for a bed and even in the ER and you don't have anything to do but sit there with your patient on a cot. Well, I will tell you that really the alternative uh, is much better for getting that patient to another center if all they've got even is a broken, a simple fracture. Um, uncomplicated, non-open fracture can be treated at most of these centers. And so I would urge you to check that out. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting how the, the system is changing and expanding and growing. And part of the process is us and being actively involved in utilizing the resources that are available to us and making sure that our protocols and our transport decisions are, are being guided by the most recent appropriate knowledge on where our patients can best be treated. You'll find links to everything in the show notes over at mediccast.com slash blog, and I urge you to check out the stuff there. You'll, you'll find a whole host of information and can follow up on these, these uh, slices of news and commentary right there. We'll get into the tip of the week coming right up. Time for this week's tip of the week, and we've got Lisa Booz joining us again from a pre-recorded segment where she, uh, we, she and I had a phone call interview, and we we're talking about EpiPen auto injector accidents. Uh, there's a lot of bad information floating around out there about what actually happens to you if you accidentally have one of these things go off through your hand. Um, you know, the instructors are always telling these horror stories, so you're making sure that your new EMT students are just going to be ultra careful. But what really happens when this accidental dosage occurs in patients? And what can you do about it? How can you be better prepared to, on what to expect? And of course, better utilize your local poison center. So let's get into this this segment with our good friend Lisa Booz from the Maryland Poison Center. Time now for another segment with Lisa Booz from the Maryland Poison Center. And Lisa, you, you kind of gave me a heads up on what's coming up in this particular segment. We're going to be talking about what happens if you accidentally get yourself with an EpiPen. That's, that's exactly right. A common call to poison centers um, happens quite frequently where people don't really understand how to use the pen or they're handling the pen for one reason or another. Um, th this is a 
particular case that brings this to light, this case was a 15-year-old boy that found an EpiPen on the school bus. And while handling it, he accidentally injected the contents of the auto-injector into his right thumb. When he arrived home, he told his mother, who promptly called 911. When paramedics arrived, they found the boy awake and alert. He was a little scared, um, but he had a cold and pale thumb, and he was also complaining of some pain and some numbness in the thumb. And that's a very typical reaction to an unintentional or accidental EpiPen injection. Now, more and more people have epinephrine auto-injectors, known as EpiPens, in their homes, in their workplaces, or they may carry them with them. And they're being increasingly prescribed for children and adults who have potentially severe and life-threatening allergies to such things as bee stings and food. Along with the increase in prescriptions comes an increase in the risk of unintentional injections. Poison centers often take calls about people who were handling these auto-injectors or they're administering the injection. They end up with the needle going usually into their fingers or their hands, but usually the fingers. And if you look at the EpiPen, um, you can really see how this can occur if you look closely at it. The EpiPen device looks like an upside-down ballpoint pen. And the needle actually protrudes or seems to appear from the button end of the pen. So it's very easy to um, misinterpret how to use the EpiPen and and get yourself into trouble by um, handling the EpiPen itself wrong. Um, Studies show that Many parents of children who had been prescribed EpiPens did not have it available, did not know when it should be given, but also really were unable to use the EpiPen, didn't know how to use it. Now, it's not just the public who end up with inadvertent injections. And I'm sure that um, many of your listeners have heard of healthcare providers, EMS providers, nurses, physicians who have accidentally injected themselves. There was actually a study of 100 physicians that were given EpiPen training um, in in auto-injectors. So there was no epinephrine in those EpiPens. And the study found that 16 of those uh, 100 physicians actually injected their own thumbs when they were attempting to demonstrate how to correctly use them. Now, epinephrine, as everybody is aware, is a potent vasoconstrictor, so you would expect these accidental injections in fingers to produce pretty pronounced effects such as decreased perfusion and ischemia. But in reality, most of the cases actually result in pretty minor effects such as the skin looking pale and feeling cold and maybe a little numbness that quickly resolves. A look at uh, cases that were reported to poison centers over a six-year period, and this was uh, published in the Annals of Emergency Medicine um, several months ago in 2010, showed that all had complete resolution of their symptoms. None were hospitalized. None of the cases needed surgical care for ischemia, and less than 25% of the patients actually required any sort of drug treatment for the uh, lack of perfusion in the finger. So what approach should you take when you're treating a patient with an unintentional EpiPen injection or if you even accidentally inject yourself? Well, the affected finger should be examined for the presence of pallor, uh, for pain, numbness, uh, prolonged capillary refill or coldness, and all of those might indicate some poor perfusion going on in the area. If none of those are present, then no treatment is required. If the patient does have clinical effects like those that I mentioned, there are several approaches that can be taken. First, topical nitroglycerin and warm water immersion or warm water soaks um, or compresses, that can all be tried to increase perfusion. Now, there are some studies that show that significant improvement might not occur by using the nitroglycerin or the warm water, but it certainly doesn't hurt to try those measures, especially if the symptoms are pretty mild. If more severe vasoconstriction and ischemia is noted, then uh, there is a drug that's often given, and it's called fentolamine. The vasoconstriction from epinephrine is a result of effects on alpha-adrenergic receptors, and fentolamine is an alpha-adrenergic blocker. It can can be given as a digital block. It can be given by intra-arterial injection, but it's most frequently given by local infiltration into the affected area. Now, in the case that I just described to you at the start of the segment, blood flow was restored by immersing the thumb in warm water and applying topical nitroglycerin paste. The thumb looked and felt normal six hours later, and he was discharged. And that's a case that we might have been able to handle at home. Um, Keep in mind that most of those cases can be managed outside of a healthcare facility. So 
involving the poison control center will ensure that patients are not given treatments and drugs they don't need, and it also saves um, some healthcare resources. So I really suggest that you call the Poison Control Center at 1-800-222-1222 if you're confronted with such a case with an unintentional EpiPen injection. Lisa, thanks a lot. And I, you know, I'm still going back to that uh, one study you mentioned, the, the 100 physicians and 16 of them managed to stick themselves with the EpiPen. Exactly. When they were trying to demonstrate how to use it, right? Oh, that's, I, I would, you know, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall. Just <laughs> that, that, <laughs> Well, it's, fun, it's funny because, you know, in the pre-hospital setting, we do a lot of education. And of course, nurses and physicians are educating their patients about use of, use of the safe use of these devices. And we have trainers and things like that to try to show how they work safely. Um, but the horror stories I know that get put out there by uh, EMT and paramedic instructors about what will happen to you if you accidentally hit yourself with one of these things uh, is uh, we want to get the best information out there. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that it's not as severe an effect as uh, some people might have heard. That's right. It is a misconception. And, and that's not to say that there have been um, or haven't been severe cases um, I'm sure there are a few cases out there where there are more severe ischemic effects, but it's extremely rare given the, the multitude or thousands of, of cases of these unintentional injections. So in, in most cases, they can be handled at home. We do try to handle these, these cases at home just with some warm water compresses or soaks, um, and if EMS arrives at the scene uh, or the patient's taken into the emergency department, then you can try something like nitroglycerin paste along with the warm water soaks. Um, and then again, we do have another medication, phentolamine, that, that can be given if needed. Um, so it, in most cases, they are easily treated and the symptoms reverse fairly rapidly. And it's always just important to remember to use your poison center resources, call them and, and let them help you assess the patient wherever you're finding them. That's right. That, that's what we're here for. So we, we would certainly encourage everyone to give us a call when you uh, see cases like this or any type of overdose or injection or um, uh, any type of situation where you need some help with assessing and treatment. Well, Lisa, thanks a lot. And we'll catch up with you next time. Uh, find out what you're going to have for us in the next segment. Okay, Jamie. Thanks. And that's going to wrap up this week's episode of The Medic Cast. I want to thank all of you for checking out the show this week. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions you'd like to share about this week's show, make sure you send them in to us. And you can send those in to us by email, podmedic at mac.com. You can also call in on the voicemail line, 941 941- 306-3342-941-30 medic. We had a voicemail earlier in this episode. And uh, also, don't forget you can always leave comments over on any of the articles or posts over at the Medic Cast website. Um, don't forget also you can catch up with me under the handle Podmedic on Twitter or Facebook, and that's twitter.com slash podmedic and facebook.com slash podmedic. So follow me or friend me, whichever the case may be. And if you haven't already done so, check out the Medic Cast fan page and there's um, 2,500 fans and growing over there and really a great community and opportunity to discuss and share. I try to post stuff there every day or so and it's things that don't always make it onto the show or make it into the MedicCast website articles but might be just a link to an interesting article I found or somebody else's site or another podcast and it's just information you might want to check out and you can respond back and forth to other Facebook professionals. A lot of EMS providers from around the country or fans there, and you might want to do so as well. So check it out, and that's over at facebook.com slash mediccast, and just click the like button at the top of the page. That's it for me. We're going to go ahead and close out the show with some great pod safe music. I want to wrap up here with a song from Matthew Ebel. We've played his stuff before, and this is one of my favorites of his, and you know you've heard it, Downtown. If you like what you hear, you can check it out yourself at MatthewEbel.com, and that's E-B-E-L, and you'll find his music there. You can also find his songs over in iTunes, and there'll be a link button in the show notes to take you over there and check out his songs in iTunes if you're interested in purchasing one of them. You know, it's, it's a small price to pay to thank Matthew for his support of the MedicCast and other shows out there by sharing his music with you, and it's just something you should do. So uh, check out his music over in iTunes and purchase one or two of his songs, and say thanks to Matt for having his music here on the MedicCast. 
That's it. I'm Jamie Davis, the pod medic. I'll be back again soon with another episode of the MedicCast. In the meantime, please remember, stay safe and remember scene safety, BSI. Daddy don't